So for the f double prime, we're looking for the derivative of this curve. So we can look for horizontal tangents because uh, where we have a horizontal tangent, the derivative is going to be zero. So we can put x-intercepts down at those places. Places where we have inflection points are going to be places where we're going to get relative mins and relative maxes in the derivative. So we're starting with a barely positive derivative here, and somewhere around here, it's going to hit its steepest positive slope. That's going to be its largest positive uh, derivative value, at least in that little region. So we can kind of identify where we have inflection points. And when our curve is rising from left to right, that'll be a relative maximum. When our curve is falling from left to right, that's going to be a relative minimum. So starting at the left and trying to incorporate all of that information, we're starting a little bit positive, and we're going to hit a maximum somewhere in this area. I don't want to make it look like an exact spot. But at that x value, we're going to have a relative maximum. We're going to have an x-intercept where we identified it. There's going to be a relative minimum somewhere at that x value there. And then we're back to our x-intercept. Somewhere in here, we're going to get a relative maximum. And then an x-intercept, which is our last relative minimum. Then to finish it out, we see the slopes of the tangent lines are going to be just a little bit negative, but getting really close to zero. So we're going to stay below the x-axis, but get close to zero. It's going to look something like that. Okay, so then you have to totally set that aside and now think differently. To get the original function, we're going to first look for where do we have relative mins and relative maxes. And that's going to be where the derivative changes sign. So our derivative goes from positive to negative here. So that is going to be a relative maximum. I'm just going to make a note to myself. And here it's going to go from negative to positive. So that will be a relative minimum. So I've identified all those. Then where our derivative has a relative min or relative max is going to be where the graph of the function as its steepest tangent line, which is going to correspond to an inflection point. So these places are going to be an inflection point on the graph of f. Now there's no y scaling at all, so you're free to start this anywhere you like. So I'm going to start it just uh, somewhere down here. And this, we can see the derivative is positive, so it's going to be increasing. Its derivative is also positive, so it's going to be concave up. So we're going to be increasing and concave up until we get to that inflection point. So it's going to do something like that. Now, at this inflection point, I'm sorry, that's going to be a... Yeah, so that's an inflection point in our curve. Now, the derivative is still positive, so we're still increasing, but now it's switching to concave down. You can see because the slope of our tangent line is now negative. And we're going to aim for a relative max wherever we end up. So I'm going to go increasing concave down and kind of gently come to a mountaintop right there. Now the derivative switches to negative, so we're starting to decrease. Its derivative is also negative, so it stays concave down until we get to our inflection point somewhere in this neighborhood. And it's the x value that's determining that, not the y value. Then we're going to head, we're going to continue decreasing because our derivative is negative. But now uh, its derivative is positive, so we're switching to concave up. And we're going to gently come into a relative minimum at that x value. Then we're starting to increase, and its derivative is positive, so we're concave up until we get to that next x value. We're going to 
change concavity again. We're still increasing and we're going to start to head towards zero. So somewhere it's approaching some unknown horizontal asymptote. Which is in there? Okay. Questions I need in the homework? Our plan is to take the final tomorrow at 8. We got a bunch of other stuff to still do too, right? And we got some other stuff to have. And Garrett's got another test to sit. Um, I was just wondering if I could have copies under review. Yeah. So you want one of each? Yes. Yeah. Any other? Okay. So I want to pick up a little bit where we left off last time. And I want to finish talking a little bit about uh, a positive and negative velocity and what the implications are there. And then we'll build on that today and we're going to give some formal new vocabulary and symbolism for that. And we'll learn to get to play with our calculators a little bit and see uh, what a cool way we can evaluate these things. So um, let's look at positive and negative velocity here. And see what the kind of implications are for that. So remember, velocity has a sign attached to it. So a particle that's moving with a positive velocity, we say is moving to the right. A particle that has a negative velocity is moving to the left. Or sometimes we might think of it as moving up and down, or a positive V up and negative V down, depending on the context of the problem. A speed is always the absolute value of velocity, so speed is always positive or zero, but a velocity can have a sign like it. So suppose that, uh, suppose a particle uh, moves right at a constant velocity, moves right at a constant velocity of 30 feet per second. For five seconds. Then moves left. at 20 feet per second for three seconds. So we're going to draw a graph of this. We'll talk about what this means, and then we'll talk about some of the language and, and, and meaning that comes from this. So we can draw our x, y axis. And so we're going to put velocity on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. So the particle starts out going at a positive velocity of 30 feet per second. So positive is uh, uh, going to the right, rather. Going to the right is a positive. So I'm going to say there's our 30 on the velocity, 30 feet per second. And we're going to go at that constant rate. And we'll do that for five seconds. So for one, two, three, four. There's the five seconds. Then the particle is going to go left at 20 feet per second for three seconds. So going left is a negative velocity. So we're going to go down to a negative 20. Now we're continuing where we left off. So time is going to now go for from five seconds for three more. So it's going to take us for eight seconds. And so it's going to do something like that. So there's kind of a visual representation of what's going on there. Now, in real life, that might be a little hard to do, but we're, we're not going to worry about that part of it. You know, it's pretty hard for a particle to instantaneously change direction. You know, somewhere it's going to stop along the way, but we're not going to worry about that. So what we can see then is this area, 
that's above the x-axis, we can think of as being that positive 30 times five is gonna be uh, 150 uh, feet. So that represents the distance that that particle traveled to the right in that five seconds. The part that's below the x-axis, that negative 20 times three, is uh, the area is 60, but we can think of that as being uh, 60 feet to the left. So there's a direction that's associated with these, depending on if it's a positive or a negative. Does that make sense? So different questions might be asked, you know, if we said, you know, the, we have to be a little careful how we ask it. So if, if we ask the distance traveled versus where we ended up. So the net change in position uh, from t equals zero to t equals eight. So the net change in position is that particle first moved 150 to the right, and then it moved back towards where it came from, 60 feet. So that net change in position was 90 feet. So eight seconds after this part, we started watching this particle, we started our timer, the particle ended up 90 feet from where it started, 90 feet right of where it started. So this can sometimes be called net change in position. It is also called displacement. If you're a physics guy, you may have heard of that. Now we can look at, ask a different question, which is oftentimes done is, uh, what was the distance traveled by that particle? So there, we don't really care about where it ended up. It's more like counting steps. You know, this thing moved 150 feet and it changed direction, but then it moved another 60 feet. So the distance the particle actually traveled would have been the 150 plus the 60. It traveled 210 feet. And so that, those are, are questions that come up quite regularly. The AP really likes particle motion kinds of problems. I think because people have kind of an intuitive understanding of, of distance and velocity and that kind of thing. So uh, how the question is posed makes a big difference in how you answer it. And so that's something that we'll come back to again and again in here. Okay, so what we were saying, and just to kind of a quick summary of what we were talking about yesterday, is that we said that uh, distance is equal to rate times time. And that is great when you have a constant velocity. So we talked about a car going 50 miles an hour for two hours, it travels a total distance of 50 times two is 100 miles. But when we have a variable velocity, then uh, what we get is this area under the curve. So this is one of, and one of the applications we will get for this idea of finding an area under a curve. It's not gonna be the only one, there's many, 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 many different applications to this idea of finding the area under a curve, which is tough because you know, we know how to find the area of geometric shapes, triangle or rectangle or trapezoid or whatever, circles, those things. But a general curve, uh, that's a tougher question. And so what we talked about is you can imagine dividing this interval from A to B into N, what we call sub intervals. And at, at the point we were talking about yesterday, we're going to try to expand that a little bit today. We were saying that those sub intervals will be of uniform width. That is, we'll imagine dividing this up into n little smaller segments, sub intervals, that are all the same width. And so we call those sub intervals generally delta x. And that we find by taking the length of our interval, b minus a, and dividing it by n. So that's the width of each of those rectangles, or each of those sub-intervals. Then we will talk about different ways of creating a rectangle. 
So we might, for one subinterval, we're going to create a rectangle here to approximate the area under that little piece of the curve. Now, ones that are commonly used are, are known as left rectangles or right rectangles or midpoint rectangles, or they might be, we sometimes, we're going to talk about some that are random height rectangles. So we might take a rectangle. What we mean by that is where on that subinterval are we going to plug in the value of x into the function to get the height of that rectangle? So a left rectangle means we're going to put the left side of the subinterval, that x value, a, into that function. In this case, velocity, but in general, it can be anything. And that is going to serve as the height of that rectangle, and the delta x is going to be the width. We might choose a right side of that rectangle and use that as a height, and that would be called a right rectangle. Sometimes we will look at that midpoint, plug that into the curve, and use that to be the height of that rectangle, and that would be known as a midpoint rectangle. Or we could just take random points anyway. So at any rate, we create, however we want to do it, we're going to create different rectangles. Usually what we do is we have some kind of scheme going in, so we might choose all left-hand rectangles, or all right-hand rectangles, or all midpoint rectangles. When we add those up, we write that notation. So what that is, is that f of whatever that x value we picked in the first subinterval times delta x gives us the area of that first rectangle. So this is the notation, what it looks like. That's the, the height and that's the base of that first rectangle. Then however we decide to choose that second point in that x value in the second subinterval, we plug that into the function to get the height. And at this point in time, we're considering the, the bases, the delta x's, to be the same. And so we do this n times, and we get then n rectangles. Okay? Base times height, base times height, base times height, add them all up. That's an approximation to the area under the curve. Notationally, we can write this using what's called a summation. So there's a big sigma, this capital sigma. And so that symbol in math means it's a sum. And then we say we're going to add the terms from 1 to n. So you start with this number, and you each time you plug it into your expression, and then whatever you get, you're going to add to, and then you bump this up 1 to the next number, 2. And you keep doing that until you get to n, and that's the last thing you plug in. So we could write this notationally as f of x of i times delta x. So that's saying plug in 1 and get f of x of 1 times delta x plus, that's what that symbol implies. Bump this up 1, that becomes a 2. f of x of 2 times delta x is our second rectangle. We keep doing this until we get to n. That's that we plug in, and that's the last one. F of x of n times delta x. That's the area of our last rectangle. So this notation we are going to see a bunch of from here on out. Okay, this summation notation. So this, as it stands, is known as a Riemann sum. So any a Riemann sum refers to any any sum of rectangles that are approximating the area under curve. And it will sometimes call the left Riemann sum if we pick the left side to get the height. A right Riemann sum if we pick the right side of the subintervals to get the height. A midpoint Riemann sum, and so on. On the AP exam, they, any of those will be fair game. So they might ask you uh, either a left, a right, or a midpoint Riemann sum, because that's on their syllabus. So. And they will test that at least once every, every three years, but it's pretty much a lock. You're going to see some kind of a Riemann sum problem, either in a multiple choice or possibly as part of the pre response test. But I think this came all the time, every year. So that's, that's the name of Riemann being a Swiss mathematician back in the, the day of, of Leibniz and uh, Newton. Okay. So. We aren't, in fact, I mean, it's easier to wrap your head around 
what it means to have a uniform width rectangle. But in fact, it can be done more generally. So more generally means that we could, um, so let me just say this. So a more general Riemann sum. And this we don't make a lot of use of, but it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it's, it's part of the math, so you really need to at least be aware of it. So let's go back to our x, y axis, and here's our generic uh, f of x function. And we're going to uh, look to find, to approximate that area between the curve and the x axis between x equals a and x equals b. So we can, we can have a variable width rectangle. And why you would want to do this maybe um, isn't immediately obvious. It certainly adds a complication that doesn't exist when we have uh, uh, uniform width rectangles. So we can imagine, I'll try to make this kind of exaggerated. You know, we pick one rectangle with there. That, so we're going to make, and however we choose our height, uh, it doesn't really matter. We're just talking about the widths right now. And then you're going to get a second rectangle. Maybe it's a different width. And then maybe there's one even different than that. And then maybe we do something like that. And, you know, how do we do it? So the idea is these widths of rectangles do not have to be uh, always the same width. And so then what that looks like is, you know, when we start adding those up, we go, well, that area is going to be approximated by f of x sub 1. And now that x sub 1 can come from whatever x value on that first subinterval that we choose. Maybe it's the left side, maybe it's the right side, maybe it's the midpoint, maybe it's any other point in there. But some value of x on that subinterval is going to be plugged into the function to get the height. And then we're going to have to call that first delta x sub 1 because it's not always the same. So I, it, it gets a subscript to indicate that it may be different than the next f, uh, delta x. And so then you get an f of x sub 2, and there's maybe a different delta x there. So I'm going to go delta x sub 2. Does that kind of make sense then why that notation is that way? And then we run out to the nth one. So it's going to be f of x sub n times delta x sub n. And maybe some of those delta x is the same, maybe not, maybe they're all different, but they're not necessarily all the same way. So then our summation becomes this Riemann sum, i going from 1 to n. We're still imagining now that we're doing n of these rectangles. So it's going to, again, look very similar. It's going to look like f of x of i, but then instead of just a delta x, it's going to have to be a delta x of i as well. So that indicating that the, the widths are not necessarily uniform. Okay, now what we talked about last time is that when we had the uniform width rectangles, so when we had something that looked like f of x sub i times delta x, no subscript on the delta x, meaning that these are all uniform width, then we could say, or what we tried to say last time, is that if we took the limit as n goes to infinity, then this goes from being, when, when n is finite, this is an approximation to the area under the curve. And when it goes to infinity, it becomes that area under the curve. It becomes equal. It's no longer an approximation. We have equality. So we've kind of come full circle. You know, we started this class calculus talking about trying to find the slope of a tangent line, the instantaneous rate of change. And we said, well, if you take the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x goes to h, you get that slope of the tangent line, the instantaneous rate of change. It involves limits. Now here we're starting to enter the second big phase of calculus, finding the area under a curve. And so again, it involves the limit. Now, if we have non-uniform width rectangles, then it's not enough to say we have an infinite number of rectangles because we could get an infinite number of rectangles if we picked one of those, 
which clearly is not a perfect match to the area of that part of the curve, and then took an infinite number of rectangles everywhere else. And that's not going to give us the exact area of the curve. So to ensure we actually get the exact area, we have to come up with a new word and symbol for it. So we, this is a crazy um, symbol and idea, but this, so it, this looks like if you've ever had physics, the magnitude symbol, looks like a double bar absolute value. And that's our old delta, that kind of Greek letter that looks like a little triangle. This symbol is called the norm. And the norm is equal to the largest uh, in absolute value of those delta x's. So it, you know, out of all these variable width rectangles, the one that is the biggest width, that's the norm. So if we take this non-uniform width Riemann sum, if we want to get the true area, we're not going to say the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity. We will say the limit as the norm goes to zero. So that means we're going to take enough of those rectangles with these different widths, but we're going to take enough of them that all of their widths are going to go to zero, even the biggest one. Is that going to involve an infinite number of rectangles? Yes. But it's not enough to just say we're going to take an infinite number of rectangles. How we get that infinite is what is important. And that's going to give us the true area. Okay. We have a lot to wrap your head around when you're starting out. So we can think of for most of the time, you know, something like this, I think is, that's enough, uh, that's pretty abstract as it is. And this just kind of adds another layer to that. Okay, so what we're gonna say then, I'm gonna go back to our more familiar form. We're gonna introduce now some new language and symbolism, some more vocabulary and symbolism that we're gonna be living with from here to the end. So we, we have this limits as n goes to infinity of uh, this uh, uniform with i going from 1 to n, f of x sub i delta x. So there is our Riemann sum with uniform width, because that's, I'm going to pick that one just because it's a little bit easier to uh, wrap our head around. But I could just as easily and just as correctly said the limit as the norm goes to zero and then put the little sub i there. So if that limit exists, we call that the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So this is now our new symbolism and new uh, vocabulary. So this stretched out s here, that's intentional. It's supposed to look like an s because it's related to this infinite sum. So that was the suggestion there. That's called an integral sum. Isn't it pretty? Well, it is years and years of practice. I took a class in that one. <laughs> Drawing integral signs. And summations, too. Mr. Hogshead says that's the only thing I do better than him, is a, is a summation. So, so, what's that? He's terrible at it. Is he? Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. Mm -hmm. I'm time about it. That's called the lower limit of integration, and that's called the upper limit of integration. The function that we have inside here, the f of x part, is called the integrand. And this, this is called the variable of integration, which for a lot of people when you're starting out, it seems like it doesn't really serve much purpose kind of hard to understand what it's really doing. It looks just like our differential dx from our derivative times, which it's not big kind of really for that. You can kind of sort of see too that as we get an infinite number of rectangles, this delta x, the width of those rectangles is going to zero. 
And so it, it's not a bad way to think of it as it becomes just sort of the symbol, the X. So that's kind of representative of that DX. It serves more of a purpose uh, if you go, if you take eventually Calc 3. In Calculus 3, you learn how to do calculus in three dimensions. And so we are, this is called single variable calculus. All of the functions we talk about are just of one variable, y equals f of x, or something equals, you know, the velocity of a function of t. But in three dimensional calculus, you can have a function that has an x variable, a y variable, and a z variable. And so in, you're, in one expression, you're going to have x's and y's and z's. I know some of your things with a little bit. So then this actually, you, will, you could get, you can actually get double and triple integrals. And so you might get a dx, a dy, and a dz, for example. So then this serves a more important purpose. It says you're going to first integrate with respect to this variable and treating these like they're constants. Then you'll integrate with respect to the next one, and then you'll integrate with respect to the third one. So there it serves more of a function and distinguishing between what you're going to do and in what order. But that's a long way off. But anyway, there we have it. So that's our, our symbolism and notation. Now what we are going to do eventually, we will have four ways of uh, evaluating we will learn four ways of evaluating these integrals. These definite, this is called a definite integral. So this is known as a definite integral. As opposed to an indefinite integral that we'll talk about also, but not today. So there, there's going to be four ways eventually we learn to do this. Today I'm, I'm going to show you two of them. And then the others we'll get uh, in subsequent days. So. Uh, one is, is kind of nice, is to use uh, an area to evaluate these integrals. Because there, there is a connection to area, although we have to be careful because it's not always exactly the same thing as the area. So let me give you uh, an example here. So I'm going to put a function here. It's a 1, 2, 3, 4. Then we'll go 1, 2, and negative one on the y. And our function is going to look like a bunch of straight line segments that are going to do something like that. And that is our f of x. <clears throat> so all we know is what we see on the graph there. And we are going to be interested in evaluating the integral from 0 to 4 of f of x dx. That makes sense? So we're going to think of it as an area thing. So we can break this apart, and we have a triangle that's above the x-axis, and we have another triangle that's below the x-axis. And remembering that, you know, so always looking in the background is the idea of this definition uh, of what it means to be a definite integral is that there's this infinite Riemann sum that is kind of hanging out in at least the back of our head somewhere. So when it's going to involve these values of the function. So when the function, as we saw with the, the velocity that was going right and left, if these values of the function are above the x-axis, then these things we're multiplying here are going to be positive. And so we're going to get then a positive result. But this part of the graph here, where the curve is below the x-axis, we're going to be multiplying by negative values. So that's going to count as a negative. Now, we can't have a negative area, so I have to kind of put air quotes around this. What we're going to get is kind of the net area between the curve and the x-axis. Well, we're going to count this part as positive and this part as negative. So an integral in general might be positive, might be zero, and might be negative. But if we're asked to find the area between a curve and the x-axis, then we have to be mindful that we're not going to count this as negative, and then we have to break this apart. And we'll talk about that in more in the days to come. So to evaluate this, we can say, well, the area of this triangle is 1 half h times height. So that's 2 times 2, half of that is going to be 2. 
You with me there? And this area of the triangle below the x-axis is one half base times height. Its base is two, its height is one. So half of that is one, but it's gonna be below the x-axis, so we're gonna treat it as a negative. And so this integral is gonna be that two plus the negative one, it is going to be one. So a definite integral is a number. Could be positive, could be negative, could be zero, okay? Now, if we do something like, say, the integral, and we'll say uh, from negative 1 to 1, uh, the square root of 1 minus x squared, oh, goodness, that's a big step from where we were. Except, if you know what that graph looks like. Do you know what the graph of y equals square root of 1 minus x squared is? And yeah, but you have to know. If we square both sides, it might become more recognizable. If we add the x squared to the other side, do you know what that is? That's a circle, right? Circle, radius, center that, origin. But what we get with y equals the positive square root of 1 minus x squared is just where those y values are positive. So that's a semicircle of radius one. Well, we know the area of the full circle is pi r squared. And since the radius is one, the area of the full circle is pi. So this is a semicircle. So this area is gonna be pi over two. So this is where we're gonna use an area argument to evaluate that definite integral. Make sense? Okay, so the third, uh, the second way we have, I think you'll like, that we're gonna use our calculator. So uh, method two is, uh, I'm gonna refer to it as F and integral. So let's do, say, the integral from zero to pi over two of sine x dx. So we know just for the background, I want to do this a couple ways. I'm not even going to say anything. I'm going to show you first the graph. This is pretty cool. So let's go to our calculator and let's go to y equals, and we'll clear off whatever other junk we have on there. We'll put sine x. Now make sure you're in radian mode. We will 100% of the time in AP calculus be in radian mode. And oh, you don't ever want to do the AP test with your calculator in degree mode, then you're in deep trouble. Because anything that you do on the calculator here uh, in degree mode, you're going to be wrong. Let's go zoom, and then uh, down option seven is a pretty nice window. So if we go zoom seven, it'll pick a nice window where we're going from negative two pi to positive two pi. Well, I'll show you that in a second. Well, they stole my uh, connector. So you're gonna have to, I hope we're looking at the same thing. Because <laughs> that's not gonna show you much. So uh, we're all looking at, you see that there's, I'll draw it on board real quick. So we're looking at, uh, we're gonna get one full cycle here, and then we're gonna get another full cycle here. And that's what we're seeing on our calculator screen. Is anybody not seeing that? Okay, so let's do first, uh, we'll do a few different things here. Let's do the integral from zero to, this is always amazing. I, mean, I hope you get the same sense of wonder out of this. So we're going to do the integral from zero to pi over two of sine x dx. Okay? So, on your calculator, this is a must-have skill for the AP exam. We're going to go math, so hit the math button. Hidden out of sight, option number nine is, it says F and integrate. See it? Hit enter. Now, if we all have new calculators, it's going to look the same, but if you have an old calculator, it may look different, and so I'm going to have to show you how to do that on the old one. So I think... Does anybody not see something that looks like that? Okay, so you have a, we have an 83? 
Yeah. Okay. So yours looks like. Um, does it say the words FN or does it say FN integrand? Yeah, it says FN. And then you just have a parentheses. Okay. I'm gonna let me get them going, and I'll come back. Yours is gonna be slightly okay. different. I have to. Uh, yeah. You have this one also. Yeah. That's okay. It'll work fine. It just isn't as user friendly as this one. So what we're gonna do, if you have the newer model, <laughs> is you're gonna arrow into here and put zero. Then you're going to up arrow into here and put pi over 2. Now, in this box, you can either type in sine x, or since you already have it in as y1, because we just graphed it, you can also go variables, right arrow, enter, enter, and put it in there as y1. So either of those will be OK. Then you'll right arrow, and you, we're always going to use dx. And then you can hit enter after that. Now, if you have a disk, it has a certain order you want to put it in. So first it wants the function. So that means, I'll just write it as f of x. You can write it either, again, you can type in sine x, or you can put in y1, which remember is variables, right arrow, enter, enter. Then you got to put a comma in. You find that comma, I think it's like over the 9 or something there. And then you are going to say x. You're telling it the variable that you're integrating with respect to. That's like the dx up here. And then you're going to plug in the lower limit, so 0, comma, the upper limit, pi over 2, and then a parenthesis. Okay, and what did you get? One. Isn't that just amazing? <laughs> that you take a curve, I mean something is bending as a sine curve, you go from 0 to pi over 2, this is an irrational number, a decimal that never terminates, never repeats. And the area is exactly one. How amazing. Yeah, sometimes it works. So, did yours work? Uh, yeah. Okay, so go back to. Uh, yeah. I Okay, so let's, um, now let me show you, there's actually a second way you can do this that is uh, visually really cool, but you don't ever want to use on the AP exam because whatever their um, algorithm is that does this, it's not, sometimes it's not quite as accurate as what we did here. So always on the test, on the AP exam or at my test, do this. Because the way I'm going to show you next, even though it's really cool looking, uh, sometimes it's not right to the third decimal place. And so you, you don't want to get it wrong just because you, it was cool. So uh, I can't show you here. So we'll, let's do, we're going to do now the same idea. We're going to, this time, the integral from 0 to pi of sine x dx. Any guesses on what that's going to be? Yeah, okay. So uh, you go back to your graph. So let's go y equals again. And just so you can see it again, just over type. So you've got sine x in there. Just hit sine again, because then the calculator thinks you put in something even different, even though you didn't. Okay, and then let's go graph. So you can just see it. That was a messy graph. Sorry, yeah. Wait, wait. Is this my emotions get the better. Curve? Just a sine curve. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, now. <laughs> Now go to, in the graphing menu, go second and then trace to the calculate menu. Second trace. Now down at the option number six, no, seven rather, you see the integral. So you hit enter. Now it's asking you for the lower limit, so we'll go zero and then enter. And now I'm going to tell you what to do, but then after you do that, make sure you watch the screen. So now the upper limit is pi. So you can go second pi and watch. Hit enter and watch. Oh, oh, oh. Wow. Is that not cool? Is that not cool? Did you get it? Oh, oh man. That is cool. And it is too, right? And you can see the shading, which I think is pretty, pretty slick. Okay? Nice. 
Now, what do you suppose? Let's think a little bit after we talk about it. Let's do it on the graphing screen because that's kind of fun. If we go from 0 to 2 pi of sine x dx, what do you think we're going to get? Zero. Yeah, because you're going to get an area above the curve that's positive and an area below the curve that's exactly the same, but that's going to get counted as a negative and it's going to make it zero. Do that. Go integral from 0 to 2 pi and see what we get. Now, what if the question was not evaluate this integral, which is what we just did, but what if the directions were to find the area between sine x and the x-axis from x equals 0 to x equals 2 pi. Isn't that still Well, because an area cannot be negative. So just as you learned in your geometry days, an area must be positive. So if we want the area between the curve and the x-axis, I mean, you know what it's going to be, right? Because this area is going to be how much? And this area is going to be, so the correct answer should be four. Okay, now the way you can do it, if you didn't know the answer in advance, there's two ways you can do this. Uh, one way is you could know where the curve changes from positive to negative. And so we could do the integral from zero to pi of sine x. That's going to be the part that's going to count the area above the curve. Now, the next part, since it's below the curve, we know that the integral is going to give us a negative answer. We want it to be positive, so we could go minus the integral from pi to 2 pi of sine x dx. That's option number one. See why that's going to work? Because this is going to give us our 2, a positive 2. This integral is going to give us a negative 2, but saying minus the negative 2 is going to add it, and we'll get 4. Alternatively, if you can use your calculator, this isn't an option if you have to do it by hand. Alternatively, if you can use your calculator, you can make this the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the absolute value of that function. And you can do that on your calculator. So let's go, let's go second mode so we quit this and go back to the home screen. And we'll go back and do it this way. So now you can do your math 9. Now you got to put in the absolute value. Do you know where that is? No. So if you go math, uh, math, okay. I have to look at it. So math menu, right arrow, to right arrow, right arrow, right arrow. And the absolute value is the very first one. So hit enter. And then you can uh, put in your, why is it one? Wrong one. I guess we should have done the numerical integration first. My bad. So do your FN integrate first. So you get one of these things. Now, if you're in this one, you can go 0 to 2 pi. When you get in here is where you got to go back to math, right arrow to the numerical part, and then hit enter for absolute value. Then inside the absolute value, you can put either y1 or sine x, and then your dx. And in here, same idea, you're going to have to go the absolute value first, then put your function, either y1 or sine x, and then x and then 0, and then we're going to 2 pi here. Does that make sense? Are we getting 4? Okay. Oh, that was a fun day, huh? <laughs>
Okay, remember we're testing tomorrow. If you want more practice, come on in. We can do some practice problems. Make sure you know how to do those problems we started the class with. I've got a feeling about those.